university students. And the final chemistry exam. They were smart, they received A's in chemistry all semester. But on the night before their final exam, they were responsible and they went partying in another state. So they didn't get back until the exam was over. They had to think of a legitimate excuse. And so they went to their professor and they said, we're really sorry, we would have made it back in time for the test, but we were coming back from visiting a friend and we had a flat tire. Can we please set a makeup test? So the professor thought about it, eventually agreed, and sent them to separate rooms to take this test that he had done. So they sat down and they turned the page to the first question. Easy. And then they turned the page to the second question. <laughs> what would you write in this situation? So stories like this that got me into game theory. I am a software engineer working at Pivotal Labs in London, and I've been mainly working on their Cloud Foundry platform, which is a platform as a service. And I found the whole cloud domain challenging to grasp. When you don't understand something, it's really useful to be able to put it into concepts that you're familiar with. And for me, that was game theory. I studied economics at university, and game theory was one of my favorite modules. And so, through my reading, I discovered how game theory can provide simplicity and clarity in the distributed system space. And so I wanted to share some of my findings with you today. So we're going to start with a basic introduction to game theory. Then we've got two games. One looks at bargaining, <coughs> and one looks at an auction. Then we're going to look at how these simple examples have been extended to real-life case studies before it will be time to wrap up. And by the end, I hope to show you that not only is game theory a useful tool for providing simplicity and clarity in these systems, but you can discover how you can efficiently allocate jobs um, in systems that you go on to build or work with. So let's begin with more about game theory. Game theory is the study of strategic interactions between rational agents. Applications include economics, politics, biology, and computer science. It was developed by Jonathan Neumann, Oscar Morgenstern in the 1940s, with many other scholars developing it extensively in the 1950s onwards. It applies to a wide range of games and interactions, and you typically see it applied to behavioral scenarios like the opening story. Despite its breadth, all games, no matter how complex, have some basic components. <coughs> so what is a game? There are always at least two players. Each player has a set of strategies, which is based on the information they have and the actions that they can take. And there are payoffs to each player for every possible outcome. So we're going to look at a game that helps us solve the low value problem. So we've got a distributed system of two computers, and we have a scenario where jobs are being sent into a task distributor, which then has to decide how many jobs to send to each computer. So let's look at the first game, bargaining. One afternoon, you're walking along the street with your friend Gemma, and you come across a bag of sweets on the floor. You both bought the sweets, and so you now have to negotiate as to how you're going to split them up. Bargaining theory attempts to give an answer as to how you will eventually divide up those sweets. So another way of saying that is that bargain theory asks, how will surplus be split between agents? So in the case of the Swedes, there is surplus to be gained by acquiring some of those Swedes, <coughs> and the maximum surplus is equivalent to you getting one of the Swedes and never getting none. So one way of answering this is to look at something called the natural bargain <coughs> solution. So in relation to the previous example, we can watch a chart that looks like this. It shows all the possible payoffs you can get by dividing the sweeps. The outer edge is the line where all of the sweeps are taken. Um, and any point inside the purple area means that after you've done your negotiations, there are some sweeps left behind on the floor. So on the axis representing Gemma's payoff, you've got the case where she gets all the surface and gets all the sweeps. And you've also got the case on the axis representing your payoff, where you get all the sweeps. And we find something called the Nash Bargain Institution somewhere on this frontier where you both have a higher utility than if you didn't take any of the sweets, and there's nowhere else in the pale set where you can redistribute the sweets between you without decreasing the happiness of one of you. And in this example, 
I'm assuming that your Sagittarius payoffs are linear and the same with respect to the sweeps. So this means that an additional sweep or two or three in your pockets is responded to with the same amount of happiness. But often in game theory, as we'll see later on, examples of the <coughs> and you tend to see curved frontiers representing the fact that agents typically respond differently to marginal increases or decreases to whatever is being bargained. But if we assume um, linear pairs for now, then the value of sweeps will be split in half between you. So this is all well and good, but you're wondering, what's the distributed system that to do with this? So we can use bargaining theory to think about how resources should be allocated within a distributed system. When we've got a system where some computers are heavily loaded whilst others have a lighter load, we can have cases of poor system performance, and we want to mitigate against that. So let's return to our distribution system um, where the two computers need to work together to complete some time. How do we model this? So the players are the computers. Each computer has a different processing rate, and we know this is from the beginning. Each computer's strategy is to accept a pre-agreed number of incoming jobs. And the payoff to each computer is related to their final load. So we assume that computers with lighter loads are better off. So in the system we're looking at, we've got computer A that can handle five incoming jobs every second, and computer B that can handle two incoming jobs every second. But together, they need to complete four jobs. <coughs> so here's what's happening. Four jobs are being fed into the main computer, and alongside this, some of those are sent to computer A, and some are sent to computer B. And we want to know how many jobs each computer can need to accept in this game. We want to distribute the jobs in a way that optimally minimizes execution time. So what do I mean by optimal? So what I'm saying is, once we come up with the um, job allocation, there's no way that we can redistribute the jobs such that one, at least one of the computer's performance is worsened and the time taken to complete all the jobs increases or doesn't, doesn't increase. So we assume that each computer has a payoff function, which we can, we can think of as the computer's <coughs> happiness. And this is going to look something like this, log of x minus y, where x is the computer's processing rate and y is the rate of jobs arriving at the computer. So don't worry too much about the log function. What it's essentially saying is that as more and more jobs arrive at a computer, the time taken to complete those jobs increases exponentially. And so here's what that might look like for a computer that can handle five jobs at the second. So if I'm a computer, from my point of view, I'm happiest when I don't do any work. I know I have to do some, but I want that to be as little as possible. And as the amount of work you give me increases, I get unhappier and unhappier. But the fewer the number of jobs I have to complete, the shorter the time it takes for me to complete that work, and the happier I am. <coughs> so we want to maximize a function that looks like this. So what that says is I've taken that payoff function <coughs> from each computer, added them together, and substituted in the processing rate of 5 and 2. And we have the constraint that the total jobs arrived at each computer equals 4, which I said was the number of jobs they've got in the range of so if you plot that function on the graph, you get something that looks like this. And we're trying to find a point up here, where happiness in the system is greatest. So when you solve for that point, um, you get that the number of jobs to send to computer A is three and a half. Meaning that half a job should be sent to computer B. So here's what that looks like. But what does this look like on the bottom end of the so here we can see the joint pay set for the system with a curved outer frontier. So this line is where all four jobs are being handled. And it's curved because the different processing rate of the computers means that as we reallocate jobs between them, the responses are different based on which computer we're looking at. So with the allocation of three and a half jobs to computer A, if you calculate the response time in the system, you get 1.33 seconds. So what if we try and shift the jobs around a bit. So if we look at this point, and we give computer A a bit more work, the optimal response time goes up to 1.39 seconds. What about if we give computer B a bit more work? Well, then the optimal response time becomes 1.36 seconds. And so what I'm trying to show here 
is that given this national boundary decision, there's no way they can redistribute the jobs without increasing the maximum response time. So by using game theoretic principles, we can find efficient distribution of resources with our systems. And we've looked at an example with only two computers, but this case can be extended to any number of computers. And it enables us to start thinking about algorithms that can efficiently distribute jobs at a system. And we'll look at that a bit more later. But for now, let's look at another game. So in the end, you and Gemma decide that instead of splitting the suites between you, you'd be better off taking them to the school playground and auctioning them off amongst your friends. <coughs> so how does this auction work? We're going to look at something called a second price auction setup. So participants in this auction simultaneously submit their bids to you in an envelope. The person who makes the highest bid wins the value of the auction, but they'll only play the pay the value of the second highest bid. So this might seem like a bit of a strange setup, but it's how things like eBay work, um, and because it brings out an interesting result. So let's look at an example of three participants. Lucy submits a bid of 25 dollars. Mark submits a bid of five dollars, and Helen submits a bid of ten dollars. So given a second price auction, Lucy will win the auction, but she'll only pay ten dollars. So auction day is it. Given how different agents value items that they're bidding for, how should they bid? So I want to interject at this point and introduce something called the dominant strategy. A strategy is dominant if that strategy gives the player their highest possible payoff, regardless of what the other players do. So to clarify, a dominant strategy is not a winning strategy. It doesn't guarantee that you win, nor do they always exist. But if they are there, it means that out of all of your options, that strategy will give you the highest payoff you will get. And the reason why I introduce that concept now is because when you have a second price auction, the dominant strategy is always bid truthfully. And when I say bid truthfully, it means, for example, in the case of the suites, it's in your best interest to bid the maximum value that you have for those suites, and no more, or no less. So let's look at that example a bit more that I gave. And let's assume that each of these three participants has bid to the true value that they hold for those suites. And these are their respective payoffs. So if they've lost the auction, then they don't get any value zero. But the payoff for a winner is the true value minus B2. Where the true value, so for Lucy, she values those suites at $25, um, and but she takes off the value that she pays, which is $10, hence her payoff is $15. So the way a second price is <coughs> set up, there's no way that either Lucy, Helen, or Mark could have rebid such that their payoff improves. So let's focus on Helen to, to try and get understand what this means. So she's come second. There's no point in her bidding any lower. It will make no difference. And in fact, any bid up to $25 doesn't, doesn't change that. What if she were to have bid $26 and she would have won the auction? Well, then her payoff becomes minus $16 because she only values the suite at $10. But instead, she has to pay $26 for them. So there is no other bid than the true value of $10 that makes sense for them. And this result is true for any participant in the second price auction. So why is this interesting? Well, we can use auction theory to reveal the resource capabilities of machines within a distributed system. So let's go back to our model. Again, players of the computers. Each computer has different capabilities, but this time they're only known to the computers themselves. And each computer's strategy is to announce a bid. So in this case, a bid is going to be a statement about how much memory the machine has. So if a computer has 10 gigabytes of memory, then an honest bid would be represented by the number 10. And the payoff to each computer is based on the result of the auction. So again, we've got two computers. The first one is 15 gigabytes of memory, and the second one, PGB, is 10. And they're going to enter an auction for the prize of winning some jobs to run on their machine. So computer A submits its bid in the form of bid A, and computer B submits its form of bid B. And ideally, we want the machine, we want the jobs to run on the machine that has the most money. So that would be computer A in this case. So that's the time to our diagram. We've now got a new component called the auctioneer. It's going to announce an auction to run the jobs in question, and then each computer is going to submit its bids. It will work out who the winner is, communicate that to the task distributor, 
who then send the jobs off to the winning machine. There's also something else going on behind the scenes here. Each computer is programmed with a payoff function, which mimics the second price auction setup that I described earlier. So let's look at what that means with respect to computer A. So if computer A doesn't enter the auction, the payoff is zero. If it loses, so it says it's got a lower number than computer B, again, the payoff is zero. But if it wins, then its payoff is going to be 50 minus 50. So that's a payoff of the <coughs> of its memory capabilities subtracting computer B's bit. So in this case, it's a rather abstract example, and we're going to ignore the burden on the machine of any job that it eventually runs. So given this, Similar to the sweet example, I want to show why for computer A, it's always in its best interests to bid a value of 15, nothing else. So let's look at why first computer A would never want to bid anything higher than 15. So in this first graph, we see that computer A is winning. It's bid 15, computer B is bid, bid 8, and it gets a pair of 7. So if the computer were to raise its bid to anything higher, say 20, that doesn't change the payoff because of the way it's set up. So there's no incentive to move. What about the case where computer A is losing at a bit of 50? So here computer B has been 70. So computer A may have wanted to a bit higher to, to, win, to win the auction. But in that case, the payoff becomes negative. It becomes minus 2 because the payoff is 15 to 17. So again, similar to the sweeps, overbidding its true value means that to win, in order to win an auction, means that the payoff will always be negative. So there's no case where the computer ever wants to overbid its memory capabilities. What about bidding lower? So here, this is a scenario where computer A is losing the election, or the, the, the election, the auction, and if it were to bid any lower, that makes no difference. The payoff still remains zero. And here we have a case where computer A is winning, um, at 15, computer B has been 8. And anything lower between 8 and 15, again, will make no difference to the payoff, unless we look at a scenario where computer A reduces its bid such that it goes below computer B, and then it goes into a losing state. And so once again, the incentive is to stick with a bid of 15. So with this example, each computer will submit an honest bid, and since it has more memory, computer A will run those jobs. So what does this show us? Using concepts like a second price auction, we can design systems that incentivize machines to truthfully report their capabilities, meaning that distribution of jobs remain efficient even as resource availability changes. So, so far, we've looked at a couple of games and we've made quite a few assumptions. For example, all the jobs and tasks that I've looked at are identical. Um, but what about needing to distinguish between one of tasks or long-running processes? And what about things such as deadlines or wanting to needing to run jobs on the same machine? And in the auction example, we ignore the burden of the machine of actually running those jobs. We just focused on the abstract second price auction payoff. And so there are, there, and there are many more assumptions implicit in the example I've discussed with you today. But the simple starting points are still key. Because not only do they help us start to think about these problems and build these models, um, these, these simple starting points have led to some interesting broader applications, which I'm going to check you now. So if we return to this bargaining example that we looked at, in a paper called Load Balancing Distributed Systems by Daniel Grossu, he showed how you can develop an algorithm based off of the national bargaining solution. So say we had a distributed system of three computers with their respective processing rate, and they need to handle seven jobs every second. So after doing the initial calculation, we work out how many jobs to send to each computer. A computer C returns a negative value. So in this framework, that's equivalent to the computer being too slow to be effective, and so we remove it from the system before redoing the optimization. And we repeat the calculation until all remaining computers in the system have a positive value for the number of jobs that are set. And so this final outcome represents that match bargaining solutions point where you can't redistribute the jobs in order to minimize uh, or in order to lower the time taken to complete all of those jobs. 
So there were some experiments set up where this algorithm was pitted against other ones that optimize for different things, such as trying to minimize the overall, the expected time for each job, or um, one of them dished out the jobs in proportion to the processing rates of the computers. And what was found was not only was this algorithm simpler to understand, simpler to program, the slowest computers weren't utilized. They were just ignored in the algorithm, whereas other allocation mechanisms overloaded slower computers. And every single job, no matter which machine it ran on, had the same um, average uh, completion time. Whereas for other systems, there was large variation in the time taken to finish the jobs. And what about auctions? So Klaus found me the platform as a service that I work on incorporates some of these auction elements when it comes to orchestrating where applications are run. So on a very basic level, what, what happens is a user says, I want three application instances. The, the auctioneer asks the machines in the system, what, what have you got? What, what space have you got? And the computers report back. Um, so in another blog post called that placement in Cloud Foundry, Diego, um, Armin um, Gupta writes how these bids are constructed based on different criteria, such as available memory and available disk, and given certain constraints, such as the fact that the available memory or the resource has to be at least as great as the required memory for the app instance, the auctioneer then decides where to place these apps. So on the surface, this is a rather straightforward setup. And the way Cloud Foundry used to place applications used to be way more complicated. And the game theoretic concepts help these engineers to find a more simple and effective solution. But sometimes you have systems where the resources are owned by self-interested agents, and any node allocation <coughs> algorithm uh, can be vulnerable to manipulation, and this can lead to performance inefficiencies. And so to help uncover this information, uh, frameworks have been built around the ideas of using sacrifice auctions. And one such framework is called a victory cloud program. So this is where computers are programmed with a profit function, a payment minus a cost. And the payment is paid out by the auctioneer after it receives the bid. And the cost is based on the burden of the machine of running whichever job it's sent. And the payment is worked out such that the computer maximizes its profit when it tells the truth about its resource capabilities. And so in these systems, the computers, even though they may have other incentives to gain more network or things like that, they'll, they'll find themselves reporting their true capabilities. And again, there's more on this in Grosser's paper. But what do game theoretic approaches mean more broadly for the type of systems that we're building? So the scene Nicholas Taleb in his latest book discussed the problem of anti-fragility. When the face of failures, systems learn from feedback and get stronger. And I think the systems built from game theoretic concepts have the ability to show some of these characteristics. Because in the face of failures, such as network partitions and things like that, the machines can be optimized and um, efficiently and dynamically reallocate those jobs again. So that's a really interesting concept to think about in relation to this stuff. A nice time to wrap up. So what are the specific results that we've looked at today? When we know the capabilities of machines in a distributed system, we can use things such as a Nash bargaining solution to help us think about how to allocate resources. And in cases where we don't know the capabilities and we want to plan this out, frameworks built around second price auction can be really helpful in helping us reveal what those capabilities are. So often game theory is criticized when applied to humans um, with regards to the real world situations because it doesn't take into account things such as emotions and other stuff like that. And so you could say that these concerns when you're looking at game theory computers don't really um, matter, at least I don't think they do. Um, but when you're dealing, but in some ways, computers can be like humans because they behave in ways you don't expect. And when you're dealing with uncertainty, you need ways to clear, clear away the noise, and that's when game theory becomes more really useful. So you don't need maps, you use game theory as a tool to understand people's issues. As a starting point, you can just think about how you would model parts of your system as a game and think about what contracts or competition need to occur between the components. And for the mathematical out there, there's a whole world of really interesting, simple, yet powerful algorithms to think about producing better computing systems. I recommend you to go and read this book um, if you're interested in finding out more. It doesn't look like it, but it's essentially just an introduction to game theory with a range of stories um, fixed going from football to war strategies. 
And when reading, you can think about how some of these examples can relate to the computer systems that we work with. And there are many other applications that I didn't touch on. So <coughs> if you're interested in cloud security, non-cooperative non game theory provides useful parallels. Maybe you're working with a database such as Cassandra and you're interested in clustering, or then you can look at evolutionary game theory. <coughs> if you want to know more about the companies in the platform of the service landscape, then coalition theory can produce an interesting if you want to dig deeper into some of the things that I've looked at today, then these are the blog posts and books that were really useful in helping me produce this talk. And one last question remains, would you like to play again? <laughs> Thank you.